here to talk about some dolls and toys and spooky things or not so spooky things, depending who you ask. Um, yeah. um, if you haven't seen the toy exhibit on the first floor, I encourage you all to do so. A lot of the items are on loan from Ellen's Museum. Um, she's the president and CEO, or just president and CEO. President, of the chief cook and bottle washer. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> chief deity. Yeah. <laughs> Whatever. Yeah. <laughs> of the um, American Doll and Toy Museum in Rock Island. So she's a very impressive collection. She's brought a lot of things to look at here today. So um, I think afterward we can oh, yeah, yeah, absolutely. come up and look at all everything. And all the stuff in the display case um, outside the elevator is, is Ellen's as well. So um, thank you all for coming. Um, that's all I have, but I will welcome Ellen and let her get thank started. Thank you, Claire. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. This is a wonderful opportunity. Again, can everyone hear me? Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Good. Now, do you know that one problem? Where, there it goes. Okay. <laughs> All right, by way of introduction, I would just like to say to this concept of dolls being haunted, creepy, vessels of evil, I would just like to say horse feathers. <laughs> I'm going to give you just a little bit of background on where dolls come from. And, and Anne Rice, and Anne Rice is sitting over here. My mother and I dressed her. So she's missing one boot that we made, but we'll find it. But everything else my mother made, she too was a huge doll collector, wrote about them in her books, especially Taltos, which she's holding a copy of. And she said, when you love dolls, you began to love all kinds of people too. And that's where I take the whole study, because it is a study of dolls and toys and related objects. Dolls are portraits of the people who made them. They're expressions of their beliefs and their cultures. And sometimes they're the only artifacts left of civilizations long gone. Uh, as early as 1908, when Laura Starr wrote the doll book, she traveled the world to look for different kinds of dolls and related objects. And even then, she came across cultures that were gone. And all that were left were their dolls. Um, they have a lot of educational value. The father of Modern American psychology, who founded the APA, G. Stanley Hall, wrote a book in 1807 called A Study of Dolls. And in 1897, that's when my grandpa was born and Dracula was written. So that's a key year yeah. in history. <laughs> he said that as far as educational value goes, you can't beat a doll or the things that go with it. OK, now back to this idea of haunted dolls. Uh, when I put this together starting a month ago, there were 4,100 plus listings on eBay alone for quote unquote haunted dolls. And people do sell them and say, This doll is haunted, it's evil. Um, we'd like $400, please. <laughs> uh, there was a place that once, it was a seller called the Haunted Funeral Home about 15 years ago, who claimed to be selling objects left in funeral homes, including a few dolls. So in another book on the paranormal that's famous, one, I'm paraphrasing, but one quote said, stay away from yard sales. Stay away in particular from dolls at yard sales. <laughs> that's something I've never really learned. But here, somebody was asking about wax dolls. This is a, port, a wax doll from the 1840s. And the, a lot of them had little slits, and their eyes would open and close. So they were like among the first of the open-closed dolls. They do crack, as we said. They're subject to temperature change. And this doll is often affectionately called Mad Alice. <laughs> Do you know your mouse? Right key. There you go. Oh. All right. We like to be scared. So that's part of this concept of dolls and, and like objects, statues, portraits, being spooky. Um, kids love to be scared. It's cathartic. As Stephen King wrote, and he's had a few goofy dolls in his books, um, he wrote and he said that in um, you take Barbie or Snow White, that's scary. Bambi or Snow White, I'm sorry, that's scary. He said that we all have these alligators within us, these aggressive tendencies, murderous tendencies. And we feed the alligators by, among other things, watching horror movies or collecting spooky dolls. There's an us and them mentality. You know, we, 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 if we kill the monster, or we portray the monster, or deal with the monster in literature or film, it's not going to happen to us. We're not like that. Also, and my generation knew this when we were little kids, there's this thrill that you're going to get a scare. 
But we knew it wasn't real. We were not in my generation afraid of monsters. We were afraid of Manson <laughs> and people like him. So, you know, there's this, this thing that you have to understand that it's not going to hurt you. It isn't real. But it's fun to be scared. And the more like a something looks, the scarier it is. Hence, the study of the uncanny by Professor Mori in 1970, where he looked at robots in particular, but also dolls. And one, Everly was his name, one writer who proceeded with Maury's work used this sweet little baby doll by the Madame Alexander Doll Company, which turns 100 this year, and said that this, to him and the people he tested, was uncanny. A little too freaky. Well, they're more realistic than this now. But, but this is still, it's a nice doll. It's collectible. It was meant to look like a baby, not to repel children, but to attract them, to want to play with it. Um, I'm not going to try to pronounce his name, but this is a study done in 1906, quoted in uh, Max von Bain's Dolls and Puppets, and it was one of the earlier studies of what is uncanny. And Maury picked up on that, and that's one of the robots. Um, he studied earlier versions of this. These are within the last 10 years. To see this, you, you wouldn't be sure that this is not a person. I mean, they are photographed in some ways that you think, oh, God. One of these was made a citizen of Saudi Arabia the last two, three years. Her name is Sophia. I find that interesting because what are these? Face it, they're big robots and mechanical dolls. They're based on the automatons of the 18th and 19th century. Um, dolls are okay to play with in Saudi Arabia, but you're not supposed to collect them. Although, they do make souvenir dolls, and we have several of them. It's interesting, the sort of... And they will sell Barbie, but Barbie has to wear the traditional dress. She can't show up as Barbie. <laughs> All right, my first encounter with anything quote-unquote uncanny was in Disneyland when I was seven, <coughs> and they had this attraction with this animatronic robot called Mr. Lincoln. And I had never heard of these. I knew about robots and mechanical dolls, but this is life-size. And I thought Mr. Lincoln was an actor. I thought they got Hal Goldberg over there. Mm -hmm. He's played him so many times. Mm -hmm. And it did freak me out, and I argued with people. Because they said, he's not real. He's, he's, he's mechanical. I said, no, he's not. I saw him breathe. Come on. <laughs> uh, it was these kinds of things that inspired the film The Stepford Wives. Oh, I don't know why that. Disney didn't sue them, really. <laughs> Maybe they hadn't thought about it yet. <laughs> Realism is something else that has passed through many movements in art. Um, sculptors like Dwayne Hansen, and we'll look at a couple of his statues. I saw them in the old art gallery in Davenport many years ago. I thought they were real people. I excused myself because I thought I walked in on somebody's art studio session. And then I saw the sign. I thought, aha. Uh -huh. Artificial intelligence and robots is not far from this realm of mechanical dolls and robots and things that move and things that thrill us. Um, reborn baby dolls are kind of the latest thing right now. And you know, we will go to shows or antique shows or doll conventions, and you'll see people, you move out of your way because there are people with strollers or baby carriers or, you know, the, the harnesses around their neck, and then you realize it's a doll. <laughs> um, this one is a pretty good one. You can come up and look at her. We have four or five others. Okay. But there, there are others you're going to see. They are more realistic than this. Um, they're used for therapy. They're used for families who have lost children or miscarried. Um, I kind of worry sometimes when I see people carrying them around like that. Do they know the difference between what is real and what isn't? I don't know. Uh, for anybody interested, I have a YouTube channel under my name, and I have one called, a little movie called Realism in Art that I did that was for my students. And there are more examples on there of portraits and other types of realistic art, and it's free. So if you have a moment, and you want to look on that, um, it's kind of interesting. Okay, wax works we talked about. Wax looks real. For centuries, it has been used to model <laughs> figures and death masks and two-dimensional portraits of famous people that are sort of souvenirs. One of the most famous, of course, was Madame Tussauds. 
Um, and there's a biography by Sylvia Martin that's pretty good about her, as well as many other things. You go to their website and they'll tell you her story. Um, her father was also a wax worker, and he would create little dolls at different stages of life of her and her friend, who was Princess Matilda of France. As I told someone earlier, the saddest day of her life was when they brought her Matilda's head and asked her to make a death mask, because one of her tasks to save her own life was to make death masks and sculptures of people guillotined. Uh, Louis Sorensen was an American doll maker and wax, wax work maker, wax worker, and he created a lot of the statues that are in um, Ripley's Believe It or Not and the old Witch Museum in San Francisco. So people hired him to make life size and small statues. Another super realistic artist who just passed away two weeks ago was Lisa Liftenfels. Uh, she built actually a wire skeleton, an actual skeleton, underneath each figure and each doll that she made to make it look more realistic. So people do take this seriously, and some of these can be terribly expensive. Here is a self-portrait of Madame Tussaud, modeling another waxwork. And you can see she is very good. If you've ever been to any even of the satellite museums, they're pretty amazing. Okay. This is from the blog and the book, Morbid Anatomy, and there are examples of these in the Metropolitan Museum of Art. This is Antonio Morende, a sculptor, anatomist, doctor, and wax worker in the 18th century. And she did these beautiful, well, they're called the wax Venus figures. Most are life size, and you can see they're showing an autopsy in progress. And she would show diseases in various stages and injuries and, and birth defects in various stages, and medical students studied them. So it's an old art. It goes way back. It is a little creepy. <laughs> Just a little. I mean, if someone were to give this one, we would take it. But, you know, we we'll take it. You know, this is not. It went. Oh, there it is. Okay, there's Louis Sorensen in his workshop. He was a friend of a friend of mine. And he worked with wax over paper, over other materials, and poured wax. And these are some of his figures. This is his wedding party. And they're about this, this size. We have, I think, a member of this wedding party dressed in blue, one of these ladies. And she is wax. And, and she does look realistic. If you photograph them the right way, it is hard to tell. All right, here is another very rare, incredible doll from one of my books. She is French. She is glazed porcelain or china. She has a wig. She has eyes that are open and I think closed. And she's got two rows of teeth. This was the desire to make dolls more realistic, which kind of comes and goes throughout history. She used to belong to a, a woman named Laura Treskow in London. I lost track of her about 50 years ago. I'd like to know where she is. I don't think anybody could begin to afford her. She is that rare and that unusual. But if you want to know, you know, gruesome and why somebody could look at a doll and say, oh my God, that's it. <laughs> right arrow key. Down at the bottom. There. Okay. This is a German doll from our collection. Um, I haven't brought her to the museum yet because she's fragile and I, I kind of want to get her her own case. She's by the firm of Kuno and Otto Dressel from the late 19th century to around 1930. And this is a doll with a character face. She doesn't look like the other dolls. Uh, and she was influenced by the Bauhaus movement. So other artistic movements, in, you know, they influenced the toy companies too. She didn't sell, by the way. She's a very rare and, and unusual doll. She came from our friend Fritzi Martinez, who has Fritzi's Antiques. And when I saw her, I said, how come she didn't sell? And she said, I've been bringing her to shows for a year. And people sort of look at her and go, <laughs> and walk away. <laughs> yeah, the eyes. The eyes are intaglio. They're painted, and they're partly sculpted. New technique. OK. Tied in with spooky dolls is Halloween. And you see many Halloween figures here. We even have Vlad the Impaler in his box over there. And you will see them outside in the display, including the official broom of the Salem witches. 
Um, Salem, Massachusetts does have an official lich. She used to be Lori Cabot, who's since retired. Lori Cabot is also a doll collector. So it's kind of interesting, this tie-in, but the broom was made in Galva, Illinois, uh, by the family of some students of mine, and every year, a gentleman, she, she said he looked like Hagrid, would come from Salem and pick up a very large order of the handmade brooms, and he would sign the invoice, the Salem Witches. Okay. Um, the Celts, of course, it was a Samhain to them, sort of the new year, when the veil between the worlds was very thin, and spirits walked the earth was one of the, the uh, background for people dressing up to hide themselves from the spirits, especially if they owed somebody money who had died. <laughs> Not good. Uh, but, but a lot of the bonfires, a lot of the traditions that we have, that we celebrate now, went back to the Samhain and they burned sometimes large wicker figures. There's a film called The Wicker Man. Anne Rice writes about that too. The, the wicker, the harvest figures that were sort of the precursors of the, the Guy Fawkes effigies and scarecrows, um, according to some sources, they actually sacrificed live people within them. I don't know if that's true or not, but it's, it's an ongoing story, an ongoing myth. Uh, if you want to know the real history and, and some of the details of it, go to Ray Bradbury's book and film, The Halloween Tree, which is awesome. Harvest festivals tie in with Halloween, going back to stories of Isis and Osiris. Um, Harvest comes at different times of the year for some cultures. So even in Kwanzaa that we celebrate now, there are gourds and vegetables that you normally see in the fall here, and they're part of that tradition. All Hallows' Eve, or Halloween, which was first used as a term in 1780-something by Robert Burns in his poem, it means it's a religious holiday. Uh, people don't like Halloween anymore, too, but I just want to point out to them this started with the church. So did El Día de Muertos, the Day of the Dead, which we now celebrate here in All Souls Day, November 2nd. So November 1st and 2nd have to do with that. And that's celebrated in a lot of the Hispanic countries and the Spanish-speaking countries. Uh, it doesn't have anything to do with spooks and horror movies. It has to do more with remembrance and a celebration of life. Okay. So Germany, how did this get to be with Germany? Well, a lot of early decorations were made there. And Germany celebrates Walpurgisnacht, or Hexennacht, which is the feast day of St. Walpurga, who was Anglo-Saxon, and she was known for healing and protecting people against witches and other things. And that falls on April 30th. And, and my friend Mary Hilliard that I mentioned earlier, her birthday was April 30th, and she used to write to me, I'm almost a May Queen. <laughs> so a lot of those festivals that had to do, and, and again, the Celts had Beltane, which was a spring festival. Kind of like what we do with Easter, rebirth, symbols of fertility, symbols of things blooming after a cold, dark winter. But on April 30th, it was the night of witches. In Germany and other Germanic countries and other Eastern European countries, and the idea was witches came to earth and you either celebrated with them or did things to drive them out in honor of St. Walpurga. Okay. There's also a, a very famous painting by Goya, who was Spanish. And I saw it in the Prado when I was little. I got to see all the, all the frightening, scary things in the Prado when I was small with my parents. And uh, most of them were done by Goy. I don't know what that's about. Um, but but it is, it is um, Satan wearing the goat's head. And all around him, you know, is a celebration. And it's, it's called Witch's Night. So it, that, that all goes back to that. Now, there are switches in these festivals. In Greece, where my family came from, Around Easter and in March, they had celebrations where they wore costumes and walked through cemeteries and hung lanterns. And there were a lot of sort of trick-or-treat traditions that we do now that they did in the spring, right before Easter. Also, if you think of the soul cakes and the wassail, where if you uh, didn't give people the right amount or the cheaper wassail or, or you know the bad soul cakes, they would come back and, and pull tricks on you. <laughs> So this tradition of pranks and tricks are connected certainly with Halloween, but also other holidays. In Germany, uh, according to my sources, it began to be celebrated widely 30 years ago, but I think it was before that, and I'll tell you why in a minute. Germany was the toy manufacturing king for many, many, many years, centuries. And they picked up on all sorts of variations on toys, including holiday decorations. 
Also, German Biss dolls, like the ones we have downstairs in the exhibit, like the one on my shirt, many people think they're scary. They don't like to look at their little teeth and their staring <laughs> eyes, which are usually hand-blown of glass, and some are beautiful paperweight eyes, actually made like paperweights. Um, but they frighten people. They think that they're looking at them. Also, Halloween coincides with Reformation Day, which is celebrated widely, and I, I saw churches here having celebrations on the 31st. They have pumpkin day parties and pumpkin festivals. Uh, Castle Frankenstein has been an attraction since 1977, which goes beyond 30 years. <coughs> There's a tradition of hiding kitchen knives on that day, lest the spooks get a hold of them and go after us all. Like, you know, Chucky has his little knife in the exhibit over there. Now, decorations, because again, Germany cashed in on this market because of their good workmanship and their imagination. Uh, between 1915 to 33, many decorations, including Halloween, including the lanterns that you, you'll see out in the exhibit, the pumpkin lanterns, were made in Germany. And there's one company that's still going on. And that, there was just an article on them, and it was Eino Schaller. They still make Halloween decorations. So I'm going to pass that around. That's kind of interesting that the strong link between Germany and Halloween is still there, and really Germany and all holidays. Um, Beistel is a company of Americans of uh, Germanic ancestry who made a lot of the cutouts we all had as kids and the honeycomb decorations. And they're still made. And the other one is D. Blumchen. And I gave their website there. They make beautiful recreations of the early Halloween ornaments that were made in Germany. So it's still alive and well. It's still an important tradition. We have our traditions here. This is Tara at Skellington Manor. And we thank Penny Steen for every year letting us take pictures and just sort of wander around and enjoy it. Penny likes dolls like I do. This is part of her doll room. Uh, I'm probably the only one who goes in there and I'm, I'm thrilled with what I'm seeing and you hear other people going through and they don't even want to look. In fact, there were fewer dolls on display this year than other years. She put some of them away, and I'm beginning to wonder if maybe some people thought that the dolls were even too creepy for one of the scariest haunted houses in the Quad yeah. Cities. <laughs> Never know. Okay, so this is more of the doll room, and, and they're real dolls. They take care of them. It's almost a museum on its own. It's kind of fun to look at them. My husband took these pictures. Uh, now there are all sorts of dolls on the wall. This one over here with the letters. Um, all over her. She was there this year. A lot of the Cabbage Patch dolls were. She just likes to buy collections, sometimes whole collections at random, and decorate with them. And she's got a good eye. She also has unbelievable statues and animatronics. I mean, if you like that kind of thing, it, it, it's like seeing a museum. I do the lights on tour. I tried to do Terror in the Woods once. I don't like things following me around. <laughs> to my embarrassment, some of my students were working there. <laughs> uh, and my husband pulled me out before the whole thing was over. Uh, and he said, I remember him saying to me, but these are your people. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but A, I can't see anything, which is why I wanted to go. And B, I don't like anything following me. So. All right, here's a real witch from Salem that I bought there in 1978, among other dolls and figures. They really do exploit it as much as they can. Although the real Salem village was actually Danvers, Massachusetts, not the current Salem. But, you know, they work with what they have. All right, here's another thing about 15 years ago that contributed to the whole creepy doll thing. There are two books of this. And these are real antique dolls. The one with the sailor hat is by a German maker named Arthur Hitt. Oscar Hitt, rather, H-I-T-T. -T. It's very rare, very expensive. And this one is a variation of dolls that I have from Germany. Their heads turn. They have like three faces. Sleeping awake crime. Um, some of them have actual heads you can unscrew, and you get more characters, and you get more sort of expression. But this book kind of made everything worse as far as creepy <laughs> dolls are concerned. And it became she-she to say that, ooh, dolls are creepy. Mm -hmm. Okay, this is my reply to that book, which will be coming out, I hope, early next year. <laughs> and, and the doll on the cover says, 
all ragged out, torn and tattered, you were my friend when it really mattered, so there's a little poem on it, and I found it that way. So other people must feel like I do about all this. All right, Tasha Tudor, beloved illustrator. <laughs> Gorgeous illustrations, wrote the dolls Christmas, very kind. I wrote her a letter and she answered me and she drew a sketch of these two dolls because I like them so much. Doll collector in her own right. Here's her father, Starling Burgess, who worked with the Wright brothers and designed yachts. So he was quite famous. Her mother was a painter named Rosamond Tudor. Now why is she in an article on scary dolls? All right, this is Tasha as a child done by her mother, and yeah, they are related to Henry VIII and the other Tudors. I think it's this doll she's holding, because it's banged up. As a prank, her father went up in an airplane and threw a doll out of it. And everybody thought it was her. So there's a creepy doll story. There's a true one. And I think that's the doll, because if you look at it closely, it isn't a porcelain doll, it's probably an early like composition or paper mache doll made of wood resin and glue and pressed into a mold. Um, again, something that Germany and the United States made. But if you look at her face, how it's banged up, you kind of have an idea. All right, dolls also are compared to corpses. Why? Well, think of vampires in their coffins mm -hmm. that rise at night. And of course, they're dolls of vampires, like Vlad over there, which makes it even more interesting. Zombies are undead who rise and don't think, but basically eat. And many authors have said and proposed dolls are not alive, they're not quite dead either. Mm -hmm. They have that quality people relate to, again, like portraits, photographs, statues, and yes, robots. Um, there, there are dolls, and we have one. Um, of a murder victim called Elizabeth Short, the Black Dahlia, who grew up in Medford, Massachusetts, the home of Vogue dolls. And she actually liked dolls herself and gave them as gifts to little kids she babysat. But on my mother's birthday in 1947, her body was found off Norton Avenue in Los Angeles and it had been bisected. And the woman who found her thought it was a big broken doll at first or a mannequin, a department store mannequin. And she's been called, there are books about her and articles, and they're called a broken doll. So there's always this association. Um, there are statues in myth and history and fiction that come alive. Venus, Pygmalion, um, Orpheus and Eurydice to a certain extent. I read about some of those where she sort of comes to life. Snow White, Thumbelina. Then we have Dahmer and Joyce Carol Oates wrote a book about Dahmer. And, and compared some of his victims to big rag dolls. There's E.T.A. Hoffman, The Nutcracker, and Coppelia. There's several French authors who also wrote stories about dolls and statues that do come to life. Uh, there's the Barbie movie, which, what is the theme? Those are dolls that come to life, folks. Even if you don't like it or you think it's stupid, that's, that's where they're getting the tradition. There is Chacmo, the story by Carlos Fuentes. And when I was 21, I got to meet him at Knox College. And I, that's about the only time I met anybody famous and, and was just completely overwhelmed. It was amazing. And I told him how much I liked Chuck Mall, the story of this statue of the rain god that a man buys like at a flea market. And slowly but surely, the statue not only comes to life, but takes over the man's existence. And when the neighbors come to find what happened to the owner, Chuck Mall answers the door wearing his bathrobe. I think that's just great. Okay. And I told him how much I love that story. He said, you have to forget about that, and he was laughing. But it's a great story. And of course, the whole concept that we mentioned earlier of artificial intelligence. Automatons and robots go back. There again is a book called Mr. Haddock's Androids. You can find it on uh, Google Play, the Google Library. It's free, along with Laura Starr, the doll book. Um, it was an advertisement for an exhibition in 1797 of androids and various automatons. An android is an automaton of a person. Uh, the others, like the duck and the monkeys and some other things, can be animals or birds. Here are some little collectibles and statues and inspirations of Frankenstein. And you'll see when you come up here that we have a Herman Munster puppet as Frankenstein <laughs> from the 60s. So that's another old legend. Mary Shelley before she wrote Frankenstein, saw an exhibition of, of automatons, and they inspired her. 
people who made them got in trouble. They got in trouble with the Holy Inquisition, among other no. things. Um, the German and Germanic version is the golem. This is the golem of Prague, a creature that is made out of mud by life. And in some versions, like the movie, he has a star. And when you pull the star off of him, he dies. Mm -hmm. So this is not necessarily spooky. This is the golem does good things, but he meets, he meets a sad end. Um, this was the favorite film of Carl Fox, who wrote The Doll in 1970. He too was a museum curator and he explored, and a collector, he explored just every, every definition and every type of doll you can imagine in their place in history. And he starts with this introduction about the golem. All right, here's some other dolls of porcelain and clay, antiques, that people find unnerving. I had this little French doll by a man named Gaudier on my, on my page one time on Facebook, and I sent it to my cousin, and one of his Facebook followers saw it and typed underneath, boo. <laughs> um, this is a character face, very rare, done by a man named Jumeau. He did exhibition dolls as well as toys. He hired orphan girls. Um, he put out pamphlets where French dolls were jumping up and down on German dolls, although actually they collaborated a lot together. And this face is often on automatons because they were characters and they were more expressive. There is a big one, though, like this, about this height. There are two known to exist, and it sold for $225,000 about 10 years ago at Theriot's. And I was doing some work for Theriot's, and I said, okay, would you just tell whoever got her to just drop me a line every so often and let me know how she is? But it, it, it's a beautiful, happy face, but people don't like that smile. Um, this is a Parian German doll again by various companies. Some of them are attributed to, to look you know, like famous people. The dead white pallor bothers everybody. They think that they look like corpses. I don't. I mean, I think they look like figurines and they're quite beautiful and they're modeled after figurines. Another French doll, she has a metal head and hands and feet and her body is very intricately articulated. Next to her is a very old African doll. And again, she's not stylized. She's actually kind of a portrait and she has ethnic features of the tribe that made her. Another French doll by a famous maker named Bru. This one is paper mache. She's one of a set of twins. Um, similar uh, dolls of her um, appear in the book Creepy Ass Dolls. They don't like her. <laughs> and this is a very rare French doll that we're very lucky to have. She's china, pink tinted, and she has glass eyes and a wig, and she's quite big. I mean, she, she has a commanding presence when you see her. OK, who's this? Yeah, this is Tiffany, Bride of Chucky. Um, a Christmas gift from my husband a few years ago. What a romantic. Isn't he wonderful? Yeah. Dino, Dino understands these things. Okay, another beautiful German doll by Simon and Halbig, who often mark their dolls with the Star of David, and existed as a company till about 1938. And again, this is one of the open mouth dolly faced dolls that freaks people out. This is Patty Playpal. Patty Playpal was made in the 60s. She's kind of from my generation. Different companies made these dolls. They were called companion dolls. They're about this big. Um, we bought this from somebody whose kids couldn't stand to look at her. They were afraid to be left in the room with her. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Whatever. Okay. All right. There's Sally Rags and the professor. There are Iron Maidens in The Nightmare Before Christmas. We saw the film. If anybody else went to the symphony last night, it was amazing what they did because they showed the film, but the orchestra was actually playing the music. I, mean, I don't know how long they had to practice to do mm. that and get it right and sync it. But, you know, Sally Rags is a big rag doll. Dolls themselves were used to make the film in stop action. So those models exist somewhere, and they're very expensive if you can get a hold of them. And they're dolls as props throughout that film, too. Okay, these are some of the automatons. Uh, in the center is one called the dulcimer player. Marie Antoinette had a similar one that still exists. Mm -hmm. And then this one, the one on the, over here, is like the one that influenced Hugo, the movie Hugo. There, that is a real automaton. It exists, and you can see it at the Franklin Institute. Um, it appeared in some of my other books earlier that were written earlier, and it was dressed like a girl. But that's the one that when they actually got it to work, the first thing he did is write out, I was made by Maillardet. 
So these are uncanny in the sense that they will breathe, they draw, they play music, they talk to you. Um, that too, these are the ancestors of those early robots and of today's artificial intelligence. Charles Lindbergh collected them. So did Pete Townsend of The Who. Uh, this is actually one of the advertisements from Haddock's Mechanical Exhibition of Androids or Animated Mechanism. This goes back again to 1797. Okay, in the ancient world, there is a tie-in with creepy dolls and some of the idols and ritual figures of the ancient world. Some were actually toys, we're finding out, or at least they were meant to be given to children, right? Um, others are, you know, like santos or religious figures of various types. Some look like, in our terms, monsters. The goddess and the Villandor figures, they're still worshipped today. They're called the Venus figures. They were part of ancestor worship. And of course, there is voodoo and image magic. And this is a big voodoo doll made by the girls that you can see at Abernathy's, not too far from here. On the far left is one of the Venus figures, which dates back about 25,000 years. This is actually a little statue dating to the time of the Neanderthal people. That's probably the oldest representation of a human figure or of a doll. Okay, and this, you probably will recognize the symbol, the international symbol for women. This is from Ghana, and it's Ashanti. And this is considered about as beautiful as you can get. They're made of various materials and sizes. It took me a long time to find one of those. Now you can find them various places. But little girls, the story goes anyway, would take these with them and strap them to their back, and in, in, it would produce beautiful but also intelligent children, hence the wide forehead. Mm -hmm. okay. um, many of our favorite monsters have been turned into dolls and action figures, aurora plastics, um, the monster high line of dolls that's so popular now. This is Wednesday's doll with no head. Wow. And then there's Wednesday up there, and she's holding another one with no head, which is kind of interesting. This is a sweet little bis doll, like this baby. And people turn them into monster dolls. That one is by Terry Long, and her company is called Long Gone Dolls. She's an artist, and they're sort of creative. But then you'll see some of these that people have all but destroyed, and I hate that. I have, I have rescued a few and am attempting to bring them back to where they were. I'm going to find the right turpentine to get the paint off of them. I don't like it that they do that. But to each his own. At least the dolls are going on. But I, you know, you're ruining something when you do that. It really isn't so much a work of art as, as a statement about why you want to destroy something. Horror movies, the earliest one I can find is 1909. Here are some of them. Uh, we mentioned the Golem, 1920 and 27, My Dolly, Dolls, 1986, Chucky and the Child Plays and the Child's Play, Dead Silence, The Puppeteer, The Murderous Puppeteer and the Ventriloquist Dummies, Child of Glass, which is Walt Disney, Puppet Master Saw, The Stepford Wives, The Conjuring, which ruined Raggedy Ann for everyone, Robert the Doll, and Robert is here, he's right here. The original Robert in Key West in a motel, or a hotel rather, is probably a Steiff doll made by the Marguerite Steiff Company in Germany. And of course, the woman in black. And there are more. This is, this is just the beginning. Here is a China head from Germany. Again, different firms. Dead white face, glazed porcelain. And this is the doll in the Disney film, The Child of Glass. It is a doll like this that is the feature of that film. How many watched uh, Swanguli last night? Okay, the, the horror host on Channel 18 too. They did it a couple <laughs> weeks ago. They have something with Karen Black called the, the, the Trilogy of Terror. And this little doll they call the Zuni Warrior Fetish Doll. He isn't really Zuni. I don't think he's any particular culture. Somebody made him up. He comes to life. They take, the first thing they tell Karen Black is don't ever take the chain off of his you know, waist, and of course it falls off. <laughs> and he chases her around for about half an hour, and she tries to hide from him. There's one great scene, they're like at the oven, and, and she's peeking at the oven, and he's peeking out of the oven, and he slams the door real fast, and then he gets out and chases her, and in the end, he overtakes her body. 
So the first thing they do is call her mother because she has issues with her mother and invite her over. <laughs> when she's the, taken over by the Zuni monster. He's expensive. They make him now. Sven Guli has one. You can have him for five hundred dollars. Oh, wow. Anybody oh. wants to donate to the museum? I will let you know where you can get it. <laughs> Buy two while you're at it. Um, then there's a series I've been watching from Canadian television that goes off and on PBS. It's called Orphan Black, and it's about a whole series of women in, who were cloned. Mm -hmm. It's confusing. I can't figure out the plot. Two of them really are sisters. The others just sort of pop out. I've counted eleven so far, but I think I'm wrong. But it's kind of this idea of, of reproducing people as if they were dolls. And they're not all nice. Some of them are quite murderous. Uh, but yeah, it's like a train wreck. You don't want to look, but you can't look away either. All right. These are from Dolls. And he spells the film with a Z, originally Stuart Gordon's film. Some of these are puppets, Italian puppets, that were made specifically for the film. Some of these are real dolls. Here's a German doll over here, a uh, more contemporary one. This is a Chase rag doll from the United States. There's a, there's a real collection of dolls in this film, and there are more of them, and that's why I like it. And of course, without giving it a quick way, completely bad people get turned into dolls so they more or less learn to behave. It's the opposite of you know, the dolls coming to life. Um, Stephen Lee of Sex in the City is in it. Uh, Stuart Gordon's wife is in it. Uh, there are a lot of uh, creative directors and, and property and cast people got their start in it. Uh, it it's really, a, it, it starts with a dark and stormy night. It's a cool film. It really is. There's a great scene involving a, a firing squad with little toy soldiers that, that I love. That should be a meme somewhere. It's great. Okay, on television we have Talky Tina of the Twilight Zone. Which was on last which night. Which was on last night also. <laughs> and who influenced Talky Tina? Chatty Cathy. <laughs> Poor innocent little Chatty Cathy. And then the Trilogy of Chair Night Gallery has had dolls. Alfred Hitchcock, who was a puppeteer, has featured ventriloquist dummies and puppets and dolls. In Seinfeld we have, of course, Mr. Woody. Mm -hmm. They appear, dolls appear in the X-Files, in Amazing Stories by Steven Spielberg, and in a television series called The River. Um, the Midsummer Murders recently had an episode called Judgment about a murderous little girl who kills people and puts the knife in the arms of her favorite toy, which happens to be a British gollywog. <coughs> the gollywog has taken a bad rap. People accuse him of being racist. He is not. The gollywog, gollywog is meant to be a sprite. There is some influence by the American minstrels, but he's his own sort of character. And he goes back to um, a clown called Chocolat from Brazil that Toulouse-Lautrec liked to paint. So the gollywog is more of a tribute, but he's gotten a bad name. And this one really is a little wild with holding that knife. Mm. There are paperbacks and horror novels with doll art on the cover. This is Ruby Jean Jensen, The Paperbacks from Hell. And she wrote a novel called Annabelle, not connected to The Conjuring, but it just happened, coincidence. Horror stories like this collection by Ellen Datlow pop up every so often. Here's one of our dolls. This is Lestat, created by artist Kreese and Co., originally in wax. He was in wax to begin with, as all characters were from interview from interview above the van. I, 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 the title has slipped my name, but you know her first book, Interview with a Vampire. Okay. Mm -hmm. Lestat is about this big, he has his own coffin, and when I asked my husband if we should get him, he said, of course, Lestat's family. Mm. And I, I've written Dan Rice, and I've studied about her and published articles about her for many years, mm. so when, when she died, I did say I lost my muse, but she was a big doll collector herself. Okay. Freud wrote, Freud, of course, delivered an essay called The Uncanny, and then Eva Marie Sims uh, built on it, and she's on the web, and hers is called Uncanny Dolls, where Freud talked about Capella and these various types of figures that come to life. He, too, had sort of a doll collection of ancient figures, so he was a big collector himself. Whatever he says about dolls, it's negative. Take it with a grain of salt, because he liked them. Pat Seacrest did the big red-headed little girl, he and his wife, Johannes Zuck, are famous doll artists. Her dolls are small. His are big. 
Um, that's the only doll that ever freaked me out. <laughs> uh, I bought it in Iowa City. In fact, I went back to get it, hoping it would be there, very excited. And the woman at the counter said, I'm glad you're taking her with you because every time I look over there, I think there's a person looking at me. I then had nightmares about it, and every time I would go downstairs and see her in the mirror where she was sitting, I would go, oh my God, you know, I mean, she moved. Um, we haven't had any incidents. She's very stylish in her Barbie shoes. But that's an example of something too realistic. Another is this little dog. It is not what you think. It is not taxidermy. It's not real fur. It's not anything like that. There are a few doll artists out there who make portraits of people's pets, not because they died or there's anything wrong with them. They just, instead of having a painting or a photograph, they want something three-dimensional. Mm -hmm. And this is actually kind of small for a real schnauzer anyway. Uh, but this freaks people out because he just looks too real. I think he's cute, but we, we keep him in Dino's office because we don't want people to flip out. <laughs> um, in various cemeteries, especially on the East Coast, there are, you, I see them here, you will see dolls and toys, unfortunately, on children's graves. It's very sad. Mm -hmm. But there are places where they actually will build a house or a glass case with toys in it. This is the inside of that house. And as long as they have families, they maintain them. So there's sort of these little living museums out there in a cemetery. Horror toys are made by these companies. Uh, we have toy guillotines and gallows out there. There's a company called Headless Historicals that does portraits of real historical people who have died violent deaths after they died. So there are a lot of them holding their heads and that kind of thing. We mentioned Terry Long and the, the porcelain doll makeovers. And poppets really were early dolls. Some of them were meant to be toys. Some were meant to be like voodoo figures in different parts of Europe. So, you know, there is a tradition. Um, there are other dolls like Julie, Pamela, and Cricket that are operated by computer chip. They're mechanical. Julie will tell you if the lights are off. Um, she used to freak out my dog very badly. Here's Julie, the talking doll who could talk and tell you she was thirsty and hungry and move her lips. And my dog would walk up to her and then back off and then bark because <laughs> he knew she wasn't alive and it bothered him. Why was she doing all these things? She reads her book too. I mean, she's, she's a little bit of a show off. <laughs> this is Kayla, the, one of the so-called smart dolls that works like an Alexa type device and has been banned in Germany as an object of espionage and other okay. countries too. But I got her on Amazon. I got in before anybody could ban her there. <laughs> she, she could be programmed to ask things like, you know, what's your mommy and daddy's social security number? <laughs> and she can record and report things. This is a smart doll, if you know Jimmy Chu, the shoe king. This is his nephew who makes, this is the inside of one, They're like robotic dolls <coughs> and mannequins with manga Japanese style faces. Okay, this is not a doll. This is a reborn baby. <laughs> of the most realistic Jeez. type that has veins in its hands and you know all the all the imperfections that a human child might have. This is by Edison. Um, if you look that up on YouTube, you can hear what the doll sounded like. It, it is a little unnerving. They were not as good at recording things then. She has a German Simon and Halbig head and a metal body, and this one happens to be ours. And they would come with a phonograph and they would talk. But it was big, expensive, and heavy. It was written up in 1890 in Scientific American. So this was sort of a wonderful thing in its time. Very rare now. I uh, saw her when I was five at his house, and of course I wanted her. I got her when I was 55. <laughs> That's how long I've waited to get some of these and how long the museum has waited. This is a Bilo baby. I brought an example up front. Designed by the artist Grace Story Putnam modeled after a little girl in the Salvation Army orphanage. Now, here's where it gets creepy. I've read some sources that said that the little girl was dead. I don't know if that's true, but she did model her after a real child. Um, the original was made of wax. This is porcelain distributed by a gentleman named George Borgfeldt, a German immigrant. Okay, here's Dwayne Hansen figures. These are not real people. Amazing. And, and when you see them up close, you can't always tell that they're not real people. 
There's one at the McNider Museum in Cedar Falls, and he's dressed like a museum guard, and, and you go by and say, excuse me, before you realize. <laughs> Lisa Lipton Fells, cloth and wire. Okay, another sort of creepy doll story by dolls primarily made in Germany, the story of Frozen Charlotte about the young girl who went on a sleigh ride on New Year's Eve and didn't wear a coat and froze to death by the time she got there was made famous in a ballad, which was resurrected by Natalie Merchant. It's also a dessert involving ice cream. <laughs> um, they're also called Badenkinder and other things, but these are examples of little pillar frozen Charlotte dolls that don't move. Commemorate a sad story. I had to tell the, the brownies, the youngest level of the brownies, that story one time, and I, I, I just kind of stopped and said, and she got a really bad cold, so always wear your coat. <laughs> <laughs> Other cultures, Frida Kahlo loved dolls, and she uh, painted this with her over there as a little girl. Four inhabitants of Mexico, the harvest figure to the far right, made out of uh, wheat, the skeleton for the Day of the Dead, the pre-Columbian figure, and the marionette. All right, there's the island of the dolls. I told you about Skellington Manor. There's a home for wayward baby dolls in Kentucky, one by an archaeologist who find, started finding dolls when he worked for the Park Service and began to keep them and preserve them. Uh, children's Little doesn't help because, again, there are a lot of stories of dolls and toys that come to life, i.e. Toy Story, and that's one of the milder ones. And there are people like Baudelaire and G. Stanley Hall and others who have studied dolls and toys and talked of their importance. They don't really talk about how scary they are, although well, Baudelaire was capable of writing some pretty frightening things. There's a picture of the island of the dolls started by a gentleman known as um, Don Diego. He lived on this island outside Mexico City. There are many stories about why he started collecting them, but it wasn't for evil purposes. Supposedly a little girl died in the canal that kind of surrounds the island, and he felt bad, and as a tribute, he began to hang dolls up outside, and of course the elements were gone. Then, I guess he drowned in the canal, too. <laughs> so now it's a tourist attraction and the subject of novels and books. All right, other places you can find about dolls, the Chicago History Museum does a creepy doll exhibit every year. There's a shelter for misfit dolls, living dead dolls, and I brought their, um, their game because there are a lot of products of living dead dolls, which were inspired <coughs> by the creator's mothers who used to make innocent little angel dolls for Christmas, and they thought, ooh, maybe we could make monsters. There's the Haunted Doll Web Museum. Spirit of Halloween every year makes spooky dolls, and a few of them end up coming home with me. And then Atlas Obscura, they interviewed me many years ago, and we talked about this thing about celebrity dolls and spooky dolls and how dolls kind of upset people, or they can. Parting words, this is something when I wrote for Midwest Modern Language Association on this stuff, um, somebody had put on a blog and said about broken up, that's the other thing, broken up baby dolls, dolls that are banged up, dolls that are sort of forgotten. She said, I think they're beautiful, look at them, they're lost, broken, abandoned, just imagine they were once loved by a child. But now they're lost, but hopefully the love still remains inside of them. Their presence still sustains in time, but still people see them as emotionless and haunted figures, mocking the being that stands before them, when really, like a child, all they want is love, not to be hurt and not to be broken. One can certainly bond with these objects, as they are so misunderstood. When we were growing up, a broken or a worn-out doll, as some of you were telling, it was the one that was the favorite. Any mm -hmm. toy that ended up in pieces or whatever, that's the one that was a success. Mm -hmm. uh, some of these others that are rarities, they're flopped. They're flops in the toy world. Nobody wanted to buy them. Okay. Here's some things to look up, including the Uncanny Valley, the original essay. Uh, some more on wax dolls and some things on the YouTube channel that I have that you can look at. Also, we have a movie that, that I've forgotten. I did dedicated it to German American Heritage Center. Mm -hmm. So, like and share, folks. <laughs> All right, now, to those who claim they have haunted dolls, and this is a rare French, again, French fashion doll, and this one happens to be a black one. Uh, if they bother you, send them to us. <laughs> and here's where we are, American Doll and Toy Museum, 3059 30th Street, Rock Island. There's our phone number. There's our website. They'll be just fine with us. We'll, we'll have no problems whatsoever. But they'll and remember your address. Huh? <laughs> they will remember your address. Yes, well, that's the next point. If you must believe the nonsense, 
the dolls are scary, creepy, and do evil things, believe this. The dolls say, we only come out at night, and we know where you live. <laughs> Happy Halloween. <laughs> Make sure you got to see the article that was going around about Schaller and the German um, decorations. Feel free to come up and look at the dolls. And do we, Claire, do we have time for questions? She had to go downstairs to okay. help our volunteer. Uh, I'm going to uh, guess we have time for questions. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I would say, yeah. Okay. About, you're about five minutes ahead of schedule. All right. Make sure you get some trinkets going around. If nothing else, get a little skeleton to dangle in front of us. <laughs> do you have any yeah. idea how many dolls you have? No, we do. We do. Yeah. We have around 35,000. They are not all at the museum. They are not all sitting at home. They are different places in storage, and we rotate them. The core collection that's there now, we have about 5,000 out on the open floor. And we have two other rooms we're going to open eventually. I'm, I'm starting on one now. We're the only two people right now working in there, so things happen sometimes very slowly. Um, I am there at night sometimes. I am happy to report nothing has happened. <laughs> <laughs> nothing weird. So, um, unless you think that you know having a museum like that is weird. There's nothing weird going on. Um, the others we keep track of in, on the computer, and I have books that put pictures and other things in. What hours are as your museum and that price? Well, it's, it's um, Saturdays normally from 11 to 3. We stagger, and it's a suggested donation. We don't force people, but we appreciate the donations to keep up the museum. $5 for adults, uh, $4, for, $4. Senior for senior citizens and veterans, a dollar for kids. Well, it's just Saturday that you're open. No, we're open by appointment, too. You call that number, or you, you have my number, and you call me or text me. We can be there and open up for you. We, groups, normally, we don't do Saturday. We do them on Sundays. We've had the Girl Scouts come, church groups, collectors groups. So and the Rotary. Have, rotary clubs. The rotary, yeah, if, you have a, the rotary. if you have a group, it's a tremendous experience mm -hmm. to mm -hmm. go and see this, well, for me, toys that you grew up with, yeah. um, and then some of the very, very old dolls are, are just fascinating to look at. They've lasted this long. We have dolls that belong to President's Daughters and to Shirley Temple and cousins of Robbie Krieger from The Doors, and uh, local, all sorts of local people, local history, some from the families with the Manhattan Projects, and we have blimps and airplanes and... The Hindenburg is flying above us, the Mir Space Station. So, you know, there's something for everyone. Well, and I brought, I brought a Betty Boop because last time I was here, we had, we had her picture and we talked about how she was designed by an Austrian immigrant, but I couldn't find any of the Betty Boop dolls, and I unpacked this one just for this. So Betty Boop is here. <laughs> Can I ask you what that head is there? That's the yeah, this is this eyes? is this is sort of the yeah. ooh, what happens because of the haunted baby doll phenomena. Oh. Uh, you can buy haunted heads and doll parts. My neighbors have one out across the street. I'm about ready to ask them what they're going to do with it after Halloween. Oh, um, spooky! And they're spooky, yeah. and people, you know, they hang them up and they put them up, and um, they, they, again, people will make lamps out of them. Planters. I have a planter <laughs> that, that looks like one of those. So they're just meant to scare people. Yeah. You mentioned. Well, they like them. That's the thing. Yeah. You mentioned the reali realism that uh, wax affords. Yeah. Um, plasticine is is also used. There yes. are the uh, um, anatomical exhibits. Yes. And I was wondering, has that moved into the doll making? Yeah, there are the some plastics. dolls like that, yes. Yes, there's some very, with that, and various types of paper clay and female clay and resin and, oh yeah, in fact, people who often repair or reproduce wax dolls, they use something like that instead of wax. Okay. Well, yes, yeah, there's, there, it's uncanny, literally, what people are doing with them now. Okay. Um, yeah. yeah. Andy's comment made me think that there is an exhibit that has traveled the world called Kripperwald or Body World. Yeah. Right. How 
Gunther Van Hagen. How do you how do you or do those figures and they are real figures, human yeah. beings? Do they fit into the realm of dolls at all? Oh, I think so. I mean, because you had that anatomical yeah, right. one up there. Right. We have anatomical figures. We actually have a, a skeleton this big named Penelope that came from a chiropractor's office, and she doesn't have her head because her head was a real human skull, and you can't sell those. Oh, jeez. It was a gentleman down the street was a chiropractor, and he bought it from his wife. Um, yeah, that those figures... ...figures that, you know, they're, they're preserved, and they use those sorts of materials to show the muscles in the body and the skeletal structure and everything else. One of them looks suspiciously like his missing wife, but we won't go there. <laughs> oh, dear. Um, but, yeah, the whole idea of corpses and dolls that, you know, Rilke wrote about and Kafka wrote about. Um, Kafka, who also, as we said last time, you know, a little girl he met lost her doll. He wrote her letters for a long time until she grew up telling her that the doll was okay and he heard from the doll and, you know. So, but they acknowledge the dark side too. And they, even in Anne Rice's books in the, the, the Witching Hour, the Mayfair family has these ancestor dolls and they're made out of ankle bones of the women who have died. They supposedly have magical properties. And then she also had baby dolls and really cute little dolls. I have a couple of them. One's a little soldier, another is sort of a Native American doll. She liked those too. Yeah, she had a museum at one time. Really? Yeah. Anybody else? You come up and look at it if you want. All right. Thanks, everyone. Thank you.